How do you do? Just a word of friendly warning. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we warned you. Hey, if you're a you know a kid of the '80s like I am, I think you'll be really thrilled with what we're about to discuss. Uh, on Skype here, I have Jessica Dwyer and Robin Block. Hey guys. Hey. Hey. <laughs> so uh, coming from, we're in like three different time zones right now too, which is exciting that we managed to make this work. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Rob, Rob, me- Robin has been losing sleep a lot thanks to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh so it's it's 11 p.m here in sunny london <laughs> oh is it sunny there that, that <laughs> well. I, I hear i hear sarcasm i hear sarcasm <laughs> online. yeah i i feel your pain i i just got back from la and I'm, we're in cincinnati ohio and the weather here is not not quite as nice as it was out on the west coast but you know i'm still adjusting back to normal but uh, Jessica and Robin are producing a documentary called In Search of Darkness, which is a journey into the culture and soul of 80s horror films, which is, you know, near and dear to most of our listeners' hearts. So I'm just going to kind of let you guys run with this and explain to me what what you're doing. Okay, so we are uh, producing a retrospective documentary on the 80s horror genre. Um, and we're sort of halfway through our Kickstarter campaign. The Kickstarter campaign has gone phenomenally well. Uh, we've got a world-class lineup of talent attached to this project. Um, and uh, it's going from strength to strength. At the time of this recording, um, which is the 23rd of October, we've got some really huge announcements to make over the next week or so, leading up to Halloween. Um, and uh, the concept behind the documentary is, is really simple. We want to contextualize 80s horror. We want to revisit how you first felt when you first sort of had these movies impact you. Um, and it's going to be a huge nostalgic roller coaster ride uh, back to uh, one of cinema's greatest eras. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say about it from a sort of introductory point of view is that, you know, if you're doing an 80s horror documentary, obviously you're going to have 80s horror icons involved. And and as I mentioned, we've got some amazing names. But also we're bringing modern horror greats and horror influencers. So we have um, horror YouTubers, the editors of some of the biggest um, horror magazines involved. Um, And so bringing everyone together, really for the first time in history, to look at 80s horror. Yeah, I love the angle that you're taking, uh, as you were saying, contextualizing, because... I, I, I have a lot of memories tied up in, uh, you know, the Reagan era in particular and coming home and ha- seeing those addresses to the nation where he's like, hey, guys, this might be the night we get uh, radiated. And then, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. So horror was kind of an escape from some of that craziness that we were as children, we were being subjected to every night on TV. Well, one thing that I really like about this is that, you know, we are looking at those that time and the and the culture that kind of created these films and and where you look at things like George Romero's Day of the Dead and and how that kind of showed the military complex at odds with everyone else and then um, one I always keep going back to is uh, uh, Brian Usna's Society and how that was all about how the excess of the rich um, and how everyone felt like oh they were apart from them and you that movie kind of showed us oh yeah there's a reason we feel that way <laughs> um, and I really love of us tackling that part of it as well as celebrating that decade yeah it's interesting because you so you, ju- you just mentioned society and we're lucky enough to have brian usner the writer and director of society uh you know attached to the project he'll be appearing in 80s or adult that's fantastic because that, that is such a bizarre and kind of wonderful movie 
in a lot of ways it's, it's almost like a, the 80s version of like a thomas swift or something where <laughs> you, you, you know like kind of uh it, it's just such good satire and i i think it's something we don't I, I, they always talk about the class war happening now but i think a lot of younger people don't realize like how stark that was and in the 80s how everybody thought they could get a piece of that lifestyle and to see the way he presented that story in that that way saying no they're a, they're basically a whole nother uh species of people <laughs> was yeah. a really great angle on that too right and and that's that's one of the things i love using horror as metaphor and that's really coming back um these days i mean Wes craven kind of went back to it with uh with uh, scream back in the 90s but it kind of that kind of got you know we kind of got thrown to the wayside a little bit and now it's coming back with movies like get out where you can use the genre to really talk about things that are going on and uh that always goes back to me for like the twilight zone how serling was kind of the king of that and and you have these directors like joe dante like tom holland like brian usna who are all in this documentary with us they're they're part of this we've got them and we get to pick their brains and talk to them about that and i think that's fantastic yeah, that's really great. It, you know, it kind of also reminds me of uh, the book Dance Macabre by Stephen King, where he talks mm. about, you know, the same kind of concept of being a kid, going to the theater to see um, sci-fi movies, westerns, and all this stuff, but there would show the newsreel footage of, like, how the Russians were beating us to space, and kind of how that informed, like, the giant bug movies and everything, you know? Like, I, I love... I think that's where horror really shines, is just like you were saying, Jessica, about how it is a great vehicle for commentary. And I think it gets devalued, um, especially when we, even though movies like Hostel did have a social commentary, I think people lost the point when they try to recreate that feeling and they just focused on the wrong parts. Right. The gimmick, uh, the, the, I guess you call it jumping on the train and, and thinking that you're doing what, Oh, that's what he's, he's just showing people getting cut to pieces. And no, there's actually thought behind of what they're doing. And, that gets lost in translation when you're just trying to rip it off. And um, also on part of that too, is the caliber of actors that horror has in it. And that's some of the, we have some of them as well. We have D Wallace who that woman can scream and cry and fight and be a mom better than like any actress that I've ever seen in a movie. You know, I mean, look at Cujo for the love of God. I mean, that, that that's a tour de force there and and um another is jeffrey combs who if you've never seen this guy really i mean he he's he's a shakespearean trained actor you know he he can do it he walks the walk he's an actor and uh i i think he's just amazing and he's in this so we got jeffrey combs too which i'm really thrilled about we've got is it gonna be a little bit of a reanimator reunion because we've got <laughs> We've not only got Jeffrey Coombs, but we've got um, Stuart Gordon, the director um, of Reanimator. And also this week we announced that we have Barbara Crampton um, as well, who um, you know, is amazing and, and has been ever so helpful. Um, so, yeah, like it's, it's all going really well. But there's something really magical and um, powerful about 80s horror especially i mean if you're if you're like me i'm 40 and you know i've found myself in my life sort of returning back to the comfort and warmth that 80s horror sort of offered us um and it's kind of weird because it's horror and you'd expect it to be sort of you know something that's not pleasant and and but actually it's really weird because um as I've as I've been meeting so many people, and and as the sort of horror community have really embraced what we're trying to do, I've really started to understand that, especially eighties horror, it's the the feelings people associate with eighties horror are so nostalgic, so warm. Um, it's a it, it's a very sort of powerful feeling, um, and that's why these films, the aesthetic, um, the tropes, why they've all endured. Um, because they have, you know, it, it, there's some magic there. I agree. Yeah. And I, I feel I'm the same, uh, you know, I'm the same age as you, Robin. And I think that uh, it's like our fairy tales in a lot of ways that, um, yeah. you know, I take that same kind of 
you know, they, the people always, when they bring up Grimm's fairy tales, are always like, well, those are the sanitized versions that most of these kids grew up with. But really, I, I think this era of horror in particular, I do think that the intended audience, a lot of it was preteen kids. <laughs> Well, and you can see, like, in the... Because we have a lot of current and modern horror masters that we've gotten on board with us. And one of them that I'm super thrilled about, I've interviewed him a few times for Horror Hound, and he's just a joy, and he's one of us, is Lee Winnell. Uh, and if you talk to Lee, you it's it, he's a fan, and these films influenced all the things that he's doing now. Like, the reason he and James Wan connected was due to their love of horror. And, uh, you know, he grew up loving the same stuff. And it just is like this beautiful circle. Um, and kind of in, in, in on the same level of that is the fact that, um, like Robin was talking about, he's he's learning as we go along with this that, horror fans are a family and we connect through, through the love of this genre and the, these stories and these films in particular. And that's why it's sort of like, you know, Freddie, you and I have, have known each other for a while, like we said. And, and um, every time you go to horror on weekend or, or a horror con, it's like a family reunion because everyone knows, you know, you get it. You're the guy that knows what I love. You, you, you get why I'm here. And uh, that kind of goes back to that feeling of this, you know, the love of this genre and these films in particular, because we all grew up with them. It's interesting because when you think back to being at school, the kids that loved horror movies were always the outside, the outsiders. And it's odd. Well, not odd. It's sort of, it's, it's kind of ironic that now horror movies and, and sort of self identifying with the horror genre is all about belonging. So you'll see people. And I went to see John Carpenter in concert last week and I looked around the crowd and, you know, it was, it was almost tribal is probably the best way of putting it. Um, you know, there's lots of people with tattoos, lots of people that, um, you know, are in the scene. It felt like a community. And, and that's one of the things that, I've, that I've, I understand now why this project is being successful. It's because it's the grassroots, the, the, the fan base support this. It's something they want to see happen. So it's a lot of responsibility because obviously it's something that we need to absolutely deliver on. Um, but that's why we've been so lucky with the names we've got attached now. Um, and so that none of this would, none of this would have been possible without the support of the horror community. And it's, it's not like other projects I've worked on like action cinema or, um, there's something unique to horror. You're kind of in or you're out. You're not really on the sidelines. Um, and horror is a huge genre, but it's like self-contained. It's like you're either, you know, you are horror you're a horror fan or you're or you're sort of not you know and i i kind of like that um i think it's definitely one of the reasons why we've been able to to look at just focusing on one era of 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 cinema um around this because it's quite a niche when you think about it, it's quite a niche subject to be tackling like 80s horror um but but it's it's highly relevant because we're we're almost revisiting that era in the current political life. You know, if you were growing up in the eighties, just like you said, Freddie, like you know, you you saw the Reagan address, you didn't know if you were going to wake up tomorrow. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, um, and those sort of things all came through the through the work. And we've we've almost in a bit of a global time warp. The eighties is in. You know, that's the aesthetic we're all following now. And yet the world is still really unstable. And and that's, it's funny how things work. Have, uh, do either of you watch, uh, it's an ABC sitcom here uh, called The Goldbergs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, do you, well, I'm, I'm sure you know by now that Freddy Krueger yeah. will be appearing on their next episode. And um, I think it'll probably be airing tomorrow night, I think. But um, I, I just thought that was interesting, too, that... It, that shows, I mean, it crosses into um, being, it belongs to the fans, but like you were saying, I think we take 
an extra step in that ownership of 80s horror in particular, where it is so much part of the horror fan's identity that um that Freddy Krueger is just a shorthand for so many things for us. Um, just like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, like these characters, uh, they're right up there with like the universal monsters as far as being, uh, at this point timeless. And they're going to be around probably for generations where we're going to see, you know, reiterations of these stories and, and the look and everything. So I do think it's interesting what you're saying about having the resurgence so much as it's not even that, um, filmmakers i i do love the new stuff that's coming out like like you had mentioned get out earlier where that's just a very original thing but i also think that there is a literal resurgence of those actual horror icons themselves uh right around the bend as well um you know like well the, it, no, go ahead jess uh, well i was just gonna say it's kind of like what happened with the universal monsters because they came out in the 30s and then with the advent of t- television everybody got back into them that's how famous monsters kind of happened was at the time um those monsters in like dracula and frankenstein all of those old old school movies were being reshown and now you've got the internet and you've got dvd and blu-ray and all this opportunity for kids that weren't even born in 1984 1985 to re you know everybody's seen halloween 2018 like oh what's that's this came from when when did that originally come out huh and they'll go back and they'll you know they're they're like what what's the hell why why is everyone going oh yeah she did the scene like he did where did that come from and then they find out oh there was one that oh and then they'll go back and 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 find it and it's it's sort of happening again with like these this next the next level of horror gods and icons with these guys and now we're talking about Friday the 13th is going to get a reboot with LeBron James producing it. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's hap- that sounds like that's going to yeah. happen now and it's it's kind of crazy how it's sort of just coming back in and and um and now you've got Robert England saying I think I got one more nightmare in me. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and uh then did you read that? by the way I'm kind of coming off a tangent here but did you hear today that he actually worked on halloween set no. the original to, yeah it came out today he was talking on a on a show robert england helped spread leaves around in california to make it look like fall in, in <laughs> illinois that is and so he was weird helping, you know, i know right but i mean seriously this it, it's like it's all circular it's all coming back and and the time is ripe for something like this to revisit it and see why these films were so important you know, not to get super sociological here, but I gotta say, don't you think there's even more potency in the fact that our generation, the 40-somethings now, we we kind of being, you know, I, you know that you hear the term man-child thrown around a lot, but the truth of it is, not only do you have this new generation coming in who are interested in this, in 80s horror, but you have... Uh, at least from like an economic standpoint and the participation, like, you know, we're buying merchandise, we're going to the movies a lot more than our parents did where um, I think where, you know, our parents may have been big fans of hammer horror or something, but they didn't carry that into, into their adult years the same way we do in this generation, the children of the Um, eighties. I think that just adds so much potency to the resurgence too. Well, and also on top of that, I think, too, it's access. We had, you know, our generation came in at a time when, and that's going to, you know, part of what the the documentary is about is how this, why this specific decade was so big for horror. And part of that, I think, and Robin, please don't let me like hog this interview, (laughs) but, but, uh, part of this, uh, the, the reason these movies were so prevalent and why they stuck with us, I think, was you had cable television hitting its prime at that point. VHS was a whole other level uh, of access to us where we were able to just revisit over and over and over again these movies. And they became part of our, our routine or our culture. I mean, there were times in growing up where I would just, I would wear out videos. I would literally watch Nightmare on Elm Street or Freddy Krueger movie every day for an entire month 
I had watched it maybe the same one just because I loved it. I just stopped pop, pop it in and just sat back and, and watch. And it just gave us the ability to, to, to revisit and get more and more acquainted with it. Don't you feel too, like, I mean, Shudder, I think, is kind of changing the landscape a little bit with this. But um, there is, in the 80s and the 90s, we had Joe Bob, who, mm-hmm. you, you know, and he was acting out of necessity. Who's, who's in yeah. the film. Yeah, who's I in saw. Documentary. I saw that. I, yeah. I love him so much. Uh, I think he is, you know, he's one of, I think, a universal horror host for a lot of us because he was so ubiquitous because of cable and everything. But, like, he's acting out of necessity with what films he can air and everything. But in a way he's also curating things that I think with new horror, you don't get that curation. Nobody's really controlling what the viewer is exposed to necessarily. So I think that added kind of to the magic where we had a shared um, culture and why we continue to kind of share that culture that maybe doesn't exist now where we were tuning into the same cable show Joe Bob was hosting a, a monster movie, and that's what everyone was watching if you were into monster movies. Well, and also it gave you a friend. It, it, this sounds very bizarre and weird to a lot of people, but Joe Bob was your buddy. Yeah. You know, he was your friend that was showing you, hey, kids, or he was like your, your dirty uncle. <laughs> yeah. That was, all right, we're going to talk about boobs and, <laughs> and, and blood and this, and uh, here's my count. And uh, um, he, he was in on it with you. He, he was teaching you stuff, which he still does, by the way, if you've, if you've seen that, The Last Drive-In, which was a lie. It's not The Last Drive-In, by God. He's coming <laughs> back. Um, but he would talk to you about things and he'd always be there and he was like the buddy that you had and this kind of goes along with mystery science theater 3000 as well was that was the same thing you were watching movies with your friend yeah and and i think that's why the the horror host was such a big part of it too and and kind of like you said helped that along you know this this film that we're putting together um you know it's never been done before what we're what we're doing so the, the 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 people that we've brought together have never been sort of put together um and where we are right now in terms of our recording we're just about to hit our first stretch goal um and as part of reaching that stretch goal like literally we're a few just a few hundred pounds away from hitting it so i'm expecting by tomorrow morning we will be there um, but we're going to deliver a, a, alongside a sort of 90 to 100 minute cut. We're going to be delivering a three hour extended cut, which is going to be like the definitive guide to 80s horror. Um, so we're going to be able to talk a, a, about a lot more movies um, and make sure that we cover even more topics. And, you know, it's almost like going down the rabbit hole because there's so many movies from that era that that people hang on to, but it's not just the movies, it's the aesthetic, it's the artwork. Um, You know, we're talking about an era where you'd go into the VHS store and you'd pick up a film and you decide to rent it based on the cover art and the film could be terrible. (laughs) Right. And often it was, often it was. And and when I was a kid, I didn't mind. I, I was like, well, you know, I've sort of been sold the concept, but occasionally, you know, occasionally the film would be as good as the cover art you know um and that was that was the amazing thing you don't get that now i feel what's really sad about um the the sort of film world is we've got access to everything on our phones you know the entire film library of humanity is is sort of a few clicks away and and with all that choice you get the sort of paradox of choice but Back in the eighties, you, you you didn't. If you rented out a movie that night, you had to sit down and watch it. You couldn't just give it up after ten minutes and find something else. That was your entertainment for the evening. And there's something about having, have, you know, almost being forced to watch watch this stuff to go with your choices, which is part of the reason why that era is so compelling now. And um, we don't get that. The, the kids who are growing up in an on-demand world. Um, ha- almost have too much choice, um, and you and you hear too much about a movie before you even decide to engage. Whereas it was a polar opposite back in the eighties, and it was a simpler time. But 
um, I, I miss that. And, and maybe that's nostalgia. Maybe that's sort of looking back on rose tinted glasses. But there was something very special about the experience of going into a shop, looking at the cover art, looking, you know, looking on the back of the VHS, seeing what critics have said seeing how that was marketed to us, that will never happen again. I think that's sad. I, I, you know, I want, I've got a young daughter who's two years old. I can't imagine when she's old enough to start choosing films and, and going to the cinema, like what, how will her experience be different? How will she be able to relate to, um, you know, getting a bad movie? You know, because you can't really do that now. If you start, you know, 10 minutes into a film now, if if it isn't grabbed, it hasn't grabbed. You can stop it. You can choose something else. Um, so I don't know if you guys have got sort of any any comments about that. Whether you found that experience yourself, or I'm, I'm interested. Um, I personally, I I miss the video stores because I I like the hunt that was involved with finding things and discovering things that came from that, but also just you would bump into somebody in the horror section or the sci-fi section or wherever, and you would start talking about movies yeah. and it would be a one-on-one -on -one thing. And, and that's kind of why I love horror cons because uh, conventions in general, even is you find fellow people and you talk about the stuff face to face. And it's, it's different from being online and, and, you know, you discover things together where you can go, you know, you're grabbing for that copy of, zombie shit storm volume 33 <laughs> or whatever and yeah. someone grabs your hand and says don't do it you know <laughs> and, and and you're like oh really and then they tell yeah. you why um but i mean that's i miss that i yeah. miss that time and that was like a thing that kind of like i said it that's what part of the vhs times that we grew up in helped grow us as as fans yeah, I, I had a very similar uh, opinion to this to, as you guys. I think most of us uh, in our age group probably do. But like, uh, I worked in a video store as, as well as spent, you know, that was like the golden moment when mom and dad would be like, we're going to go. It was network video for us, which had a great um, horror film section and a great sci-fi section. And it was a trip where, okay, kids, you each get to pick one movie. And make sure make it count uh, because that's your weekend. <laughs> and we, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and when I was an adult and I was working in a video store, I uh, I made a point like it was the same thing where I was like, I want to I want to know everything about a particular genre. I would just start alphabetically and start working my way through movie by movie. And it's like you were saying, Robin, if I took it home and I started it, I finished it. And part of that is one there distractions there weren't the distractions we have now um which in and of itself not just when choosing a movie or choosing to finish a movie like uh, you could lose yourself in something so much easier i think because you didn't have the smartphone and you didn't have laptops or even at that point in my life we didn't even have a computer in our home um it was it was really very much like a a very particular experience with uh, very little in its orbit other than you and the the vcr and the tv exactly so freddie i have a question for you now that i found out that you worked in a video store because i worked in one too what was your go-to if because i had a i had a time when a guy came up and said i want a movie that's going to make my girlfriend throw up <laughs> <laughs> what was your go-to movie when someone said i either want to I, I want a movie that's going to scare me to death or i want a movie that's going to make my significant other barf well that's easy like for me dead alive or brain <laughs> me dead. Too. really yeah yes! yeah the, if somebody came in and wanted to be grossed out i would steer them to that or meet the feebles both peter jackson <laughs> Uh, for scary movies, honestly, Exorcist 3 was always a go-to for me, um, e even more so than the original. And I love that it's having kind of a renaissance right now. I've noticed it's been getting a lot more love, which um, I think it because Exorcist 2 was so bad, I think Exorcist 3 got short shrift from most people. But uh, I think, yeah, I want to say if it was hereditary um, has made people go back to Exorcist 3 because of the, the crawling on the ceiling scene. Oh, yeah. Because that immediately made me think of that. 
<laughs> yeah, and that's technically, I guess, that's a '90s movie. They're the ones I yeah, mentioned are '90s movies. Yeah, but. they're not '80s, but but that I mean, come on, Dead Alive. You have to tell them to go to that one if you want them to puke. That's right. <laughs> well, that's you know that that movie we in Europe we got that re- that was released as Brain Dead. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, you know what I've heard today is that and Bad Taste are all mm-hmm. getting 4K um, restorations. Really? Yes. Oh, I don't God. know how, how can you how can you watch Bad Taste in 4K? <laughs> I was kind of thinking was the shot same thing. On like 16 millimeter. <laughs> I can uh, you know, it took, prove it. <laughs> it took four years to make, and Peter Jackson made it with his parents and his mates in New Zealand. Um, there's a, I'm not sure it'll probably be on the DVD or the Blu-ray or even the 4K release, but there's a wonderful documentary about Peter Jackson making Bad Taste, and the documentary is called Good Taste Made Bad Taste. And it's just like, he's, he, you know, like the, the alien heads are being cooked up in Peter Jackson's mother's oven. And, you know, like uh, he did it consecutively over four summers with his mates and and um you know to see there's something really clever about that narrative just the narrative of sort of peter jackson's career how you can come from new zealand in i think auckland or wellington where he grew up and and reach the very very heights of hollywood um just through following a passion and and um when i think about bad taste i know it wasn't um that wasn't was that eighties? Was Bad Taste? 80s? I feel like that was late eighties. I think it late was nineteen eighty nine or something like that. Yeah, it was at the tail end, right? But like, um, I love that aesthetic, that sort of reachability. You know, mm-hmm. we're not talking about the thing. We're not talking about something that is like a masterpiece, but we are talking about a film that has, you know, a soul. You know, there was something to that. It wouldn't have gone anywhere if it hadn't have had that. Well, and I, I, I mean, I, we had uh, the, 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 the actor that played Lionel from Dead Alive and or Brain Dead, yeah. you know where you yeah. were. We had him at Horror Hound Weekend. It was his first American convention, and my sister and I were kind of his handlers. And it was the most hilarious thing. He's walking around, and it wasn't even the big hotel that we we do our show at. And he came in, and he's looking around. And he's like. I think there's the equivalent of my country's population here because <laughs> it, it, it just gives you an idea of how New Zealand isn't that big and, and, oh, and it's taken, you know, everybody knows it now and it's com- the world knows it for, for the Lord of the Rings and Peter Jackson. And, um, he, he had a great time. He actually brought the vest that he wore with him. He still had it really from the, yeah, <laughs> it was hilarious, and he was so that, sweet. That was one of my favorite movies, Brain Dead or Dead Alive. Like it's just, you know what? I'm going to revisit that. It had so <laughs> many bonkers scenes. Like just thinking about it, like one of the, my favorite scenes is when her ear, his mum's ear, falls oh. off. Oh yeah, the custard. God. Um, so gross. Um, but even like the rat monsters at the beginning, like the whole thing is just awesome. So, and they're like stop motion yeah. too, which was fantastic. Yeah, 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 the little um, rat monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> rat monkeys, yeah. I love it. Oh my god, it was such a great movie. So oh. I'm really pumped about In Search of Darkness. I don't know if you could tell, but I am. I'm very thrilled about it. And uh, so, if people want your main site, is that right? Is it CreatorVC dot com? Yes. Well, that's the name of my company, uh, which develops um, special interest bachelor entertainment. Um, but the there's actually a website specifically for this project. Right now, it's redirecting to the Kickstarter. But if you go to 80shorrordoc.com, you'll find all, all the information. And if you go, uh, you know, the day this podcast comes out, it will probably go straight to the Kickstarter. You'll have the most up-to-date information on the contributors we've got attached. And like I said, I've got some major names which are about to announce over the next week or so. Um, and you know, if you're interested in 80s horror, if you want to be part of this, you'll never get another opportunity to help make this happen. And there's, as at the, at the time of, uh, this 
conversation. If I if I just check on Kickstarter, we have eight hundred and sixty four backers um, so far, with about twelve days to go. So all in all, I'm ex- I'm expecting about twelve hundred and fifty backers, and that community of people that really love eighties horror are going to be responsible for making something that I think the whole horror community will embrace. And um, just to be able to be part of that is a real honor. Yeah, and uh, by the way, it's 80s, 80shorrdoc.com, correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's not the word 80s, it's 80s. Yep, so uh, I think our listeners would definitely be on board for this, and I'll be putting this out at 9 a.m. tomorrow, uh, Eastern Standard Time. So if you're hearing this, there's still 11 days left in this campaign. Uh, I, I think it's something you'll definitely want to look into because it sounds amazing. So thank you. Thank you. And there are some awesome perks to go with it as well when you pledge. So check those out. We've got soundtracks, t-shirts, all kinds of cool things. And Graham Humphreys did our artwork and he is amazing. That's awesome. So check that out. Uh, thanks again to Jessica Dwyer. And thank you. Excuse me, Robin Block. Uh, we met in the middle of time zones. We've opened a riff in the space time continuum. <laughs> we're all going to die now because we're all going to be sucked into the black hole. <laughs> right. <laughs> Brady, right. thanks so much for, for having us on. Obviously, we'll we'll um, we'll support the podcast. We'll share it across our social channels. And if you're if you're interested in following us, we we've built up quite a following. We've got about just over three thousand Twitter followers, um, and um, the handle for all our social media is 80s horror doc so 80s horror doc uh find us on instagram twitter facebook and uh and and join in all right fantastic thanks again guys take care freddie cheers bye-bye If he should go to 